it's me. I'm at the site. I'm sorry, man. I really am. I wish I could turn back the clock. Hey. Hey, what are you... You'd never met him before. I saw a picture of the two of you together. I don't know what you're talking about. What were you doing with Tyreman? Frank? What are you doing? Frank? Welcome, everyone. So uh, this was the question, basically, that we were hoping that audiences would ask encountering that piece of content, which aired um, on FX in September and October of last year in the middle of Sunday Night Movies. And uh, hopefully, they're interested enough in you know, wh who is behind that, what is that, is that a show, uh, what happened before, who are these characters, does he really drive that very nice car into the Hudson? Um, that they would go online, they'd be intrigued enough to go online uh, and in investigate a little bit more. Um, you might also have seen at that same time, if you were watching, if you were at a movie theater, a series of trailers for it that would direct you to that same URL. Or if you'd been watching the Primetime Emmys the week prior, uh, you might have seen a promo for it there that, that talked about it as an FX series. Um, and uh, the, the idea really uh, was the, the result of about a year-long development process that Mediacom the agency for Audi, Audi of America, and FX uh, did together to develop something um, that would function this way and that, um, you know, that would uh, take advantage, I think, of what was unique about the brand and unique about um, the network. Um, this is, uh, to my left, is Benny Lawrence of Audi of America, and next to her, Pam Henning from FX. Uh, this was really the core team that, that worked on this project um, for really almost a year. It's not the first project that we have done with Audi or that Audi has done. Um, and you, know, you can see some of the things. We, you know, we worked on a film called Truth in Motion, which was about the US ski team a couple of years ago that aired on NBC. Audi has made a film about Le Mans called Truth in 24 that had a television broadcast and has been downloaded about, I think, 350,000 times on iTunes. Obviously, if you're fans of Iron Man, the franchise, you've seen their vehicles in that. Benny, why does Audi think it's important to take on these kinds of projects and in such a consistent way? The overall Audi look and feel is really um, sporty, sophisticated, and progressive. And we really try to keep true to those words, even when we're doing branded entertainment. We really do want to showcase vehicles in the right way and truly be entertaining. So we look for projects, and we tend to we do do some big things like Iron Man, obviously, in the film space, where it's just an absolute perfect fit. But in a lot of cases, we actually do develop our own ideas with our agencies or with partners that are, we think are really synergistic to the same kind of sporty, sophisticated, and progressive. And in this case, why, uh, you know, we talked earlier about a lot of different kinds of ideas. Why FX? Yeah. 
in this case, FX was one of those perfect partners. If you think about the programming, uh, specifically the originals that FX produces, very well known for quality, smart, sophisticated programming, and we just felt that that very much fit with us from a core point of view, and so it was a, a good chemistry for us, and we went to them and said, this is who we are, this is what some of our strategic needs are, and that's how the whole relationship and idea ultimately blossomed. Now, we talked a lot at the beginning um, in very strong terms about how this was not going to be a micro-series, it was not going to be a web series, it was going to be something really different. Um, you know, what was the thinking behind that from your side? I, yeah, I mean, I think there are a lot of um, interstitials out there and a lot of things that you see on cable networks. Some of them are absolutely wonderful and they're great for specific brands, but we wanted something that was a little bit different and that really kind of broke the mold. And the intention behind this was really to kind of help us get to something very special for what was for us the, thir the third of three big launches last year. We had an extremely big year in 2011 in that we were repositioning three of our most premium products. The A8, which was our absolute luxury, you know, high-end luxury vehicle. That's what was featured in the Super Bowl last year in the, um, the Good Night Spot and Release the Hounds that you may have seen. A7, which came in March-April time frame, which literally I don't think I have enough fingers and toes to count how many car of the year awards that particular car has won. It's just the sexiest car you'll ever see. And then A6, which still very much in this CD category for us, the relaunch of a very beautiful, very lovely luxury car, but a little bit more of the entry. For all of these vehicles, Me Mediacom really helped us develop an overall strategic platform, which we refer to as Sunday Strategy. And Sunday Strategy is really based on a consumer insight that says, people who are more likely to be interested in luxury cars and have the means to purchase luxury cars really do spend a lot of time with media from a more enjoyable point of view, kind of nice frame of mind on Sundays. And so much of where you'll see our advertising really is focused on Sunday primetime. We've done Sunday um, NBC NFL for a number of years now. And so this also kind of dovetailed very nicely with a movie that FX had on Sunday nights as well. So everything kind of all came together and we got very lucky that last year when we started our relationship with the Emmys, FX being the sister with Fox, we were able to also run the trailer for, to, um, for this particular Jersey City project in the Emmys as well. So it's like when all of those integration things all start coming together and they all start to fit so well from a strategic perspective, you really get exciting things happening. Now, uh, obviously the vehicle features prominently. Um, it, it's not, a, it's not a, a secret from the audience that, that there's a, a, a brand involved in this, but it's, nor is it really, does it hit you over the head. We're not an in-your-face kind of company, and um, you know I love, our director for this was Dan Minahan, and I just loved him. He was fascinating to watch, especially in the 105 degree um, heat wave of New Jersey this past summer. Um, we, you know, we want to showcase the vehicles so that they have an organic role in what we're doing. If it's not organic and it doesn't make sense to the character, then it's not right for us and we really don't want to do it. So we don't, we don't like gratuitous logo shots. That's not who we are as a brand. We like for the brand to be either a very innate part of the character. I think Iron Man is a very good example. Tony Stark and an R8, they just fit together so incredibly well, not only from a vehicle, but from an overall Audi perspective. Um, now, we started this uh, a long time ago in conversations with, uh, with the sales and marketing team at, at FX, but it was very important to us, obviously, uh, to make something that felt like programming. And I think it was uh, maybe a little bit unusual that how closely we got to work with the programmers at the network. Um, and, it w you know, very early on we sat down with Eric Schreier and then after this really got in motion, we worked with a, a terrific executive named Jonathan Frank at every stage of it, um, in the outline phase, at the script phase, through production, um, a really deep level of involvement from them. And you, you mentioned Daniel Minahan, the director, mm -hmm. who we selected with the network um, as somebody who they really 
wanted to work with. He's uh, uh, very experienced. He comes from independent film. He made a terrific movie called Series 7, The Contenders, a bunch of years ago, but he's directed Game of Thrones and, um, and True Blood and a number of other series for them and others. Um, it was, I think, an unusual process for them. It was uh, a great process for us. Can you talk a little bit about that collaboration? And, and it really was a true collaboration because to get all of the different departments of FX to actually work with a brand, because as you know, FX is basically, there is no box. And if you look at our slate of original programming, you've got everything from American Horror Story to Sons of Anarchy. And we looked at this really didn't fit within that programming environment because A, it wouldn't be relevant to the piece that was created, and B, it would have gotten lost. So knowing that, <clears throat> excuse me, Sunday was a key initiative, we were able to pull everyone together and really from standards and practices to Jonathan Frank and the entire current team, really got this um, series to look and feel very similar to an FX series. And if we were to liken it to anything, I think it was very similar in structure to Damages, mm -hmm. yeah. which had this back and forth from four minutes later, four minutes from now, and it really worked well on the network. The other really smart thing that Benny and her team and Adam and his team did was really market this like it was a TV series. So you had your website that was built within the FX programming environment, so it looked like one of the shows on the network. It wasn't a micro site that lived elsewhere. And all of the teasers that we did on air within the movie environment, so we would look at running the, the series in breaks five and seven because movies tend to rate higher toward the back end of the film. And we had teasers, we had tune-ins, so it really was like a campaign for an original the way this ran on the air, which was really exciting. Yeah, and it's funny to think about doing on-air promo for a short-form series, but uh, it really created the impression, I think, for the audience that this was a piece of programming. Now, we all talked about it as this is work in, the, 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 the unique idea here, I think, is the work in progress drama. The idea that, um, in a way, you're integrating a, um, a car into a show that doesn't exist. Uh, but you're going to talk about it that way, you're going to show it to the audience that way, and you're going to hopefully hook them and intrigue them in the same way that a series would, so that they come back and say, where's this going? Uh, how can I see more? When does the series launch? Who's behind this? Um, and sort of get invested in it. That experience didn't come through on air promo, and it didn't come through watching the episodes, except for the fact that you're watching something that feels like a fragment. It really, I think, came to life in the digital experience. You want to talk about, about the kind of uh, things that we did online? Well, there, again, there, the way the website was constructed, it lived within the FX Network's environment. And we provided the viewers with episodes that they could watch, they could re-watch. We also had character um, bios. We also had characters that weren't really in the piece that were highlighted. And we had a lot of response from a social media point of view, particularly when it came to name the series. And we did have a couple chuckles because of the name of the show being Untitled Jersey City Project. We had a lot of fans from Jersey City that had some really great ideas for names for the show. Yeah, one of the uh, most popular names was Chilltown. Uh, literally, I have mo probably one of the most votes of all of the submitted names, which is only, I think, if you live in Jersey City do you know that that's what you call Jersey City. So it's hometown, a lot of hometown pride. But the social media was very sticky, and there was a lot of response from folks, and the episodes viewed really well continuously throughout the four weeks of programming. It was also interesting that the, the, the writer, Peter Mattei, I think once he realized that you didn't have to pay off any storylines, I think that one of the things that we talked a lot about during development was the, some of the issues that you see with short form series is that um, frequently, there's a need to have plot mechanics and to, to resolve everything within the course of X number of minutes, a far shorter time than you would for, say, a TV pilot. Once he realized that he didn't have to resolve anything, it was incredibly liberating. And some of the things that were online, like the additional scenes, were uh, even maybe feeling somewhat contradictory to what you'd seen, or they felt like alternative versions of the story, introduced characters that weren't in the eight episodes that we produced um, that explained all of a sudden revealed a huge amount of backstory um, you know, you just knew that it was a very freeing process because you were going to create something that was a much larger canvas than you could fit into 17 minutes of, of screen time. Um, now, the other way that this was really brought out there, because I think that, you know, the, the scale of television was very, very important. The cinema um, experience 
brought in a much larger entertainment focused audience. But social, you mentioned social media. There was a lot of uh, syndication of this content and outreach to bloggers across a lot of different types of categories from automotive to entertainment um, to video aggregation sites to try to get this in front of people and create the kind of scale that we all think is important for this. Um, the cinema experience is, was notable in that it was, um, you know, Audi is always pushing us basically to try to do things that are really different and um, the way that that played out was a sequence of trailers a 15, totally unbranded, again, back to the sort of the Audi philosophy in approaching these things, uh, a 15 second snippet that felt like a burst of narrative and then just went to black. And then there would be a few more spots in the, in the preview space and then another 15 second narrative featuring a different character, back to black. And then finally, we run essentially the trailer for it, 30 seconds that is a call to action to the website. Um, and th those are the kinds of ways that we promoted this, but it's really, I think, speaks to the Audi philosophy of of how do we use the specific uh, medium that we're in to, you know, to sort of something innovative, something that'll really interest and kind of hook an audience. Now, you know, when we talk about hooking an audience, you know, mm -hmm. it sort of brings us inevitably to a conversation about uh, what does that mean? And how do you measure that? Yeah. I mean, I think when you get into measurement, we always try to look at things up front and say, what's gonna, what's gonna ultimately be success for us? And we talk about how well is this gonna resonate and resonate tends to take many different forms, engagement. I think to your point, Pam talked about the stickiness of the social media um, and the pass along of people who were sending episodes to people. I think that was incredibly important to us. Um, we had some really great you know, numerical measures at the end that ultimately made us happy. We had about um, five, mi five million views of the episodes yeah that were just in the digital space. That didn't include what was actually on FX. So we were very happy with how many people actually saw the episodes. Ultimately, the reason we did this, as I was saying earlier, is we wanted to make something special for the launch of this A6 and something that was very different. And for us, it was about really creating a great image and creating desire for this particular vehicle. But again, we did it in a very, very subtle way. And so we definitely achieved those objectives. If anyone's read the press, we've had a really, really good sales year at Audi. We've had our second year of um, breaking 100,000. We just broke over um, 117,000 units in this country. And so that is amazing. We think these types of very high profile, exciting projects help us really get that brand image out there, and that's why it really works for us. I don't um, think you mentioned TV ratings. Yeah, you? I was gonna say, the one thing I did wanna talk about, my favorite metric of all of this is um, the TV ratings. We talked about being in the movies. Um, the, the actual episodes, the minute by minutes, were 17% higher than the actual pod breaks within the movies. So that to me suggests engagement beyond even just yeah. social media engagement. So it was really wonderful for us to have all of those different types of metrics. And so those are, those are the ones that are, you know, everybody's out there measuring. I also think that when you look at what we did from a PR perspective, one of our goals anytime we do any of these projects is are we going to be able to get PR out of it? And we had trade press, not only in the marketing and advertising community, we had local press in Jersey City, which was pretty interesting. Um, we also had Wall Street Journal. We had a lot of broad press around this program, and quite frankly, even in the entertainment industry, we had very positive press, and that is another, again, measure of success for us. Our final measures of success really started to come in um, at the end of last year, and that is, we were very excited about the fact that we had, um, we won a creative media award for creative for this particular project, but we also won a creative media award for the Sunday strategy, and that was for media plan, and then we also were a finalist for the research behind um, that particular Sunday strategy. So. Ultimately, when we talk about projects and how these things start, we always talk about the fact that they really need to be grounded in strategy and finding the right partners and putting together the right thing. When you start to then actually be able to get industry accolades for it, it just again feels like all of that integration really starts to come together. So very happy with how this ultimately turned out. Um, and 
it's still fun to watch now. I'm just like yeah, going, yeah. oh my God, I forgot that was in episode eight. So. Um, you know, one of my favorite things from it, uh, the, the, the hometown aspect of this really reminds you that you can do a national campaign, you can do something that is in movie theaters all over the country, is on a television network in prime time that is seen by a lot of different people, but uh, the Star Ledger wrote a feature about this, a young woman at the Star Ledger wrote a feature about it. There's a, the, the young woman in this is a reporter at the Ledger, you know, just a paper, could be anyone. Yeah. Um, and uh, she's, her piece was, had a, a distinctive sort of snarky tone to it, which is like, I don't know, you know, what, who these people are writing this thing and where they think they're, they are, and I don't know, you know, these characters, I really don't know if they, they correspond to reality. Where online, all the commentary was, I know exactly who this is based on, I know the developer this is based on. Um, they, you know, also, by the way, just pure speculation with no actual bearing on reality, but they were positive they knew who the characters were. The writer was like, I really don't see any, any connection, and it's like, well, it's, sister, it's, it's, it's you. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what to say. Yeah, very true. And Go ahead. Can I yeah. make a point about, um, again, back to the collaboration? Instead of, you know, square peg, round hole, let's create this content and then run it on the air, it really was um, a partnership from beginning to end, and some of it was a little challenging, particularly the heat wave when we were shooting. That's special. Yeah. Um, but it, it's really, again, it's opened up the eyes of the network from a point of view that we can actually work with brands as partners instead of working with advertisers. And I think there's a, a big difference when you look at a network like an FX, who the president of the network is very, very um, appreciative and protective of the creative process around the original programming on the air. So for the network to feel really comfortable about Audi as a partner and with Adam and his team from the Mediacom side, I think is a real testament to the collaboration itself, the quality of what we got at the end of the day, and it, it really broke some new ground. So I, I have to say it was a great experience across the board. Yeah, and, and, it, and it is challenging. I mean, these things are, I think, hard to pull off for a lot of reasons. I think there, there's a, a feeling that, you know, we want it to look and feel very much like the network, but not so much like the network that there's some confusion about. Um, that you're creating confusion, although I also think that that rating number is, is a, it speaks to the confusion in a kind of a positive way. You go into a commercial break, you see this, it's, co it's clearly content, um, and then it ends, and it's not really that great a surprise that you don't see a lot of fall off in the break. You know, Benny mentioned that 17% rating number. This did 17% uh, you know, better than an average commercial, because I think the audience is, for the first at least minute, is wondering what the hell they're watching on some level. I think one of the things that's really important as well is I think a lot of the panels that I've seen over the last few days talk about um, digital distribution and I think what was important for us for this particular project is having broadcast, having digital, having a true integrated approach to this. I mean adding cinema to it added yeah. even more because you are really driving people to an idea and quite frankly it's a, it's a sophisticated story and it's a story that you it gives it gives the person watching it the opportunity to kind of create their own ending create their own mythology and when you think about it that's how a lot of really successful formats begin is by really engaging that viewer on a very different level so I think that was really important for us as well I do think a lot of people that are probably going well this is so successful what are you gonna do with it next will we see it more I don't really have an answer for that yet yeah. um, you know what I will say though is I want to we talk to you about that, actually. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, we're very happy with how it turned out, but we're still thinking about some things on this one. Now, we probably have time for a couple of questions. Anyone? I love it. I think it's very creative. Uh, what did your dealer groups think about it in Jersey City compared to other? Uh, I mean, weren't they a little p piffed a little bit? You know that. Honestly, we didn't. We didn't have any negative feedback from any of our dealers. So they weren't upset that you didn't call it like Orange City Project or something like that. Yeah. No. Yeah. I, that I was just curious and. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, Actually, we, we got a lot of help from the dealers. Uh, we sourced those vehicles from dealers, uh -huh. and they were very mm -hmm. excited about it. Um, 
I think that if they had been on set at three in the morning as these cars were ripping down gravel alleyways, they would have been less excited. But um, I think they, they sort of, they, they got into the spirit of it and they were really helpful. And it was, it, it was in the middle of the summer. It was in an incredibly unpleasant time to be making anything. And they were, they, they bent over backwards. They delivered cars to us. They had a, we had a tech on set um, all night basically doing nothing, just in case we needed him to set up, because the, these cars are really complicated um, electronically in terms of the, mm -hmm. the, the navigation systems. And um, they really threw in, and they helped a lot. Mm -hmm. So I think they got kind of galvanized by it. And for your advertising dollar, how did you measure your return on investment for something like this as opposed to something like Iron Man, putting an Audi in Iron Man? I mean, h how do you know that dollar for dollar it paid off just as much? I, maybe that's too broad. Well, I don't know that I would say that you could put something like this in the same category as Iron Man. I think what you have to do is you have to look at each project individually mm -hmm. and make some assumptions as to what you think is going to be your ultimate measure of success. Iron Man's on a very different scale, and so to do something on a film basis where you are doing additional advertising, et cetera, around it, very, very different. Um, you know, you have, to, you have to look at each of them individually. So. I love the US about the lion. Any of you will hope that you're all there. Great. Anyone else? Hi, Stuart Augustine. Uh, I was just curious uh, more on the Olympic uh, side of things. Uh, I just read an article, I think it was in Ad Age or something like that, but it was what statistics to what statistics do you pay attention to, what do you not pay attention to? And Olympic the Olympic viewer ratings, as I'm sure you guys pay attention to, have uh, they've steadily decreased. I'm pretty sure, and I was curious, why why don't you pay attention to that? And if you do, does it worry you maybe in the future on doing partnerships with the Olympics? Is your question? It, it, it's more of uh, do you pay? I mean, is the steady decrease of the Olympic viewership a concern to you guys, or do you can? I mean, do you see yourself partnering with them in the future? Maybe answer that a slightly different way. Well, um, I would, yeah, I was going to say the only thing that, that I would say is um, we have been an advertiser in a number of big events. Okay. We were recently in the Winter Olympics. Um, I think it's been fairly public that uh, BMW now has a significant relationship with the USOC, and therefore NBC can't sell any Olympics to any other competitive car manufacturers oh, beyond I'm the domestic MCO, and, okay. and the BMW partner. So, um, so I'm not really sure. Yeah, I, you I, know, I, it was more of an opinion thing than anything and maybe in the future. Also, I had one other question. That one was a tough one to answer. I'm sorry. What about the uh, competitors for the Iron Man movie? Did you guys have to fight through any of that? What, uh, what ploys did you guys have versus uh, other car companies maybe that were throwing their name in the pot? I'm sorry, competitors for... For placement in Iron Man? Yeah, uh-huh. I don't... Was, there, was I, there a lot of competition or not really? You know what? I don't really think that's something that would be appropriate for oh, us to okay. talk about. All right, I'm sorry. Um, that's, that's a particular we had, we film thing. We had to hurt thing, some people. So. Okay. We'll, just, we'll talk about it later. Yeah. Um, no, the, I want to go back to the Olympics thing for one second okay. because um, Audi has a long-standing relationship with World Cup skiing, and Audi of America has a long-standing relationship with the U.S. ski team. Okay. And when we did that film that I referenced earlier, the goal really was to be around the Winter Olympics in a really meaningful way and not just to advertise in it, um, but to help tell the story and to be part of the story. And since this is really, it's a 25-year relationship mm -hmm. with World Cup skiing, the idea that, that we could follow the U.S. ski team and, and a number of the skiers and sort of see what it, what it takes to become a world-class skier and a champion very close in spirit to what Audi is about, and a lot of the things that, that that level of skiing is about are things that Audi is about, and I think we were able to communicate that in a very, not in, in an inobtrusive way in the film, so the audience would walk away from it saying, they really support skiing, okay. and they're cool. Okay, and I think okay. that, that that in a lot of ways was really what that project was about, and we did get very nice ratings for it. I mean, actually, uh, I don't want to say this and offend uh, anyone from NBC, but we did better than NBC's own programming in the time period. Okay. Um, and, and in terms of Olympic ratings, I mean, I think, quite frankly, every advertiser is interested in networks and large events delivering big ratings. And so if there's been ratings erosions from the Olympics from year to year, as we all know, there are a lot of 
factors with that, time mm -hmm. zones, coverage, et cetera. I mean, NBC has obviously been a long-term uh, partner with that. Okay. I know they have retained some of those rights, et cetera. I do think, though, this past weekend is a very interesting telling tale, and that is what the headline was, 33.4% of the U.S. watch the Giants game. Uh -huh. And so I think what that ultimately says is if you have good quality content, in this case I know it's live sports, but you know if you have that out there, viewers will make that appointment and will keep that appointment, especially for something that's live. Okay. So, you know, I think, you know, the Olympics are still an extremely important place to Definitely. be. Definitely. So. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right, I think we're out of time. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Thanks. everyone.